today. So I am Nicole Francoeur. I am the Senior Outreach Committee Chair for the We Are Pentucket Municipal Ballot Question Committee. We're happy to have you here today. Um, we have a great panel here to provide you with factual information about the middle school high school building project. We hope that you will engage them all in their rounds of questioning and I will take some time to introduce them and then Dr. Bart will get us started with a brief presentation to bring everyone up to speed on the project and where it currently stands. Um, and then we'll open it up for questions after that. So we do want to try and get to as many questions as possible. So please wait. We will call on you um, and we will go from there. We'll try and keep the program to about an hour. So um, please help yourself to refreshments and materials in the back afterwards as well. So thank you. So to introduce our panel, we have Logan, Caleb, and Ben, who are current Pentucket Regional District School students, representing our student population today. We have Mike Wood, a selectman from Groveland, who I'm sure you're all familiar with. <laughs> we have David Roberts, who's a current um, Groveland resident with us today. And we have Dr. Bart, who is our superintendent for Pentucket. And I do want to acknowledge we do have um, Jonathan Seymour in the back as well, who's the president for um, Principal, sorry, president would be nice. I just promoted him, but he is the principal for the Pentucket High School. So. And Mr. Seymour has also been, if you have building questions, the history of the building, he has been uh, the chair of the building committee since it started back in 2015. Yes. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bart for the presentation, sure. and we'll go from there. Yes, yeah, so I have to use this. It's a small audience, but I have to use this because this is on TV. It's being live streamed, so... Hello to TV world. Uh, first, I think most of you know this is my hometown, so I'm very, very happy to be back in my hometown doing this presentation. In July, I don't know if I was so happy to walk into this situation where you have this new building that's about to be built and there's a lot of questions. Uh, and certainly when you come in, in a new, to a new situation, um, you know, you have to investigate those, find out what is the real status. Is this a lot of hype about the building project or is it something that's actually needed? So that was my primary thing is to find out, obviously meeting with Mr. Seymour and everyone else, where are we in this process? What is the status of our current buildings, not just the high school and the junior high, but also, sorry, the middle school, but also how, what shape is Bagnell in? What shape are the Merrimack schools in and how, how's Page? How are those schools looking? My ultimate responsibility, I'm going to say this at the front, is the children of our school district. That is my primary responsibility to make sure that they're taken care of in every way possible during the school day that we have proper facilities, we have proper and professional educators as well. And we've got, we're great with our educators. I just did a survey and the parents and the students are all very happy with the level of professionalism our educators provide on a day-to-day -day basis. So let me come down to the facilities because that was in the survey, one thing that popped up. So let me just give you kind of a, a journey of where we are and where we've been. <clears throat> So some of you will recall, and it's not there up on the slide, back in 1999 when I was teaching at Pentucket, I was a science teacher, and this vote came up for a new high school in Merrimack. That vote did not make it. That vote got voted down. At that time, the state was looking to reimburse us about 72%, and the cost to the district was about $14 million. Two very big numbers that we no longer have access to, and we will not have access to, again, based, based on our demographics. Um, so since that point in time, it's not that Pentucket was sitting stagnant, not doing anything. They recognized there was a need for new facilities, the high school in particular, and they had applied what was the, to the SBA, the, the, the school building authority, which became the MSBA. In the MSBA, we were not accepted in until 2015. So we were accepted into this process. This exact project, four years ago, is when we were accepted. And that's a key timeline to think about because it's been four years to get us just to this point. And it doesn't matter if, if, if anyone's going to be accepting the project. This is not a slow process. This is the state process that we've been following. And it's a really good process because they force you to think about where things have been. So basically, it's been 16 years since we've gone through and been accepted by the state. And I know Senator Tarr and Representative Mira had this statement at a, a presentation I did in Merrimack, and that is they don't just accept anybody. It's not like a political angling, you throw, you, you talk to someone, you know someone, you get in. They looked at our independent assessments that were done by people who came to assess the facilities and saw 
that we were in trouble. Our facilities were in trouble. And because of that, they allow us into their process. So that's kind of where we are in getting accepted in 2015. After that, they go around and start talking to the community about what they want in a school. Do you want just a high school, which was the initial thought, or do you want to do a high school and a middle school? So the state thought the middle school and the high school saves the taxpayers more money in the long run, and it saves them more money. Because if you just build the high school, they know the middle school is going to have to happen just a four or five, six years later, and those are two really expensive projects. So that's actually what came out of the visioning, visioning session, that the 712 is what the community had wanted, but they wanted some separation still. And you'll see in the design kind of what that separation looks like. This is a really good kind of graphic to show you where everything has been. You can see that four years ago, we're accepted. First time since the late 90s we've been accepted. This past summer, when I arrive on scene, is when people are voting on which model do we like. So there was everything from let's just repair it to let's renovate it, let's build a new high school, let's build a new 712, and there were eight different models. And there were costs, there were estimated costs that were out there. So when you were hearing $1,000, that was an estimate. That was based on just a vision of what the architects had. There was nothing that was designed yet. It was just an idea. So they have an estimator that comes in and they do that. So we submitted that information to the state. And on Halloween, I was down there with the state MSBA board for approval. It happened also to be the Red Sox per victory parade. So I was very excited to be there for the state. And then after that, I was able to celebrate by watching the Sox go by. But the state ex ex accepted our initial design and then allowed us to go into schematic design. That allows the architects to start designing out what the building would actually start to look like. At this point right now, we're about 20% of the way through the design. So it's still not a lot of detail, but it's a heck of a lot better than what we had back in July. So because we're that far in, in February, they have two more estimators, one from the architect and one for now the construction manager. They go, they go and they look at what the design is, what the plans are for the education and for the physical building, and they come up with two more estimates. So if you saw on the paper, uh, Pentucket building is $9 million less than what we had uh, projected back in July. It's absolutely true. It was $9 million less because we started looking at it and saying, OK, what do our children need to get a great education? What do the teachers need to provide that education? What we didn't do was say, OK, what do administrators need in order to facilitate this building? In fact, there was a building that was in their new administrative building that was listed in there for, I think, $4.4 .4 million. That's gone. And I think if you saw in the quotes kind of my philosophical approach to it, you can put me under a climate-controlled tent, and I'm happy to work in it. I don't need a fancy building. Education is not about me. Education is about the children and getting them what they need, not extra nice things. We don't need, to buy, we, you know, we don't need floors of gold. We don't need fancy uh, siding. We just need the fundamentals that are going to be there, and they're going to sustain for 50 more years. So we don't have to deal with this again in my lifetime or yours. So at this point, we are now in schematic design. We are tonight, there's a building committee meeting tonight, actually, at 6.30 at the high school. Uh, and we will be uh, talking about some of the updates, and there will be more, new pictures. But in April, the MSBA will send to us Here's exactly what we will reimburse you for this project. Now, we have estimates, and I want to be very clear on this. When we, try, when we go on estimate, I am a person who says, if you, if you tell me something's going to cost $2, do not come back to me and say it's $2.20. It better be $2 or less than $2. So we've tried to be conservative with a lot of our estimates so that people are not getting or we're not putting people in a position where they're paying more than what they were told. We want to make sure it's pretty much on par with what we said. So in April, we'll get the exact amount. The number that's out there right now for the building, 146.3 million. Our communities are responsible for 93.2% of that. No, sorry, 93.2 million of that. Uh, and you'll see kind of the breakdown. So April is when we'll get that number. April 29th is when the town hall vote is. And you do that every single year. Town hall votes happen every year. And that is a majority, 50% vote, 
or the, the simple majority that's there present, if that passes, then it goes on to the ballot. And then on the ballot, it's simple majority again. If that passes, it goes. But it has to pass in all three towns at both places. So it has to pass at town hall, and then it has to pass again at, uh, at the ballot. So even if it were to pass at town hall, I don't think people who are for this vote should say, oh, well, that's good. We don't have to worry about it. it you still have to vote. And my overall job for today and nonstop is to make sure everyone who goes and votes at town hall and at the ballot, if they vote yes, they understand what a yes vote means. The implication of it, there's implications when you vote yes. If there's a no vote, you understand what the implications are of a no vote. And we'll go over those in a little bit because both sides, there's significant impact. No one's walking away from this vote one way or the other without, any, without being impacted. Everyone's going to be impacted no matter which way this vote goes. So why are we here? Well, I'll show you some pictures in a little bit. The reality is 1956 is when um, Pentucket High School was completed. Um, the, the middle school, the junior, former junior high, was completed shortly after that. There are all sorts of issues with our infrastructure. And a question that's an easy question to ask, well, why don't we just fix that? We'll get to that slide in a little bit. The answer to that question is we can't. There's some things we can fix, and there's other things we cannot because it's too expensive. Not that it's too expensive for us to go to the towns, but as soon as you hit a certain price point, you were required by the state to bring your building up to code. And we'll talk about what that cost is uh, in a little bit. But really, the independent assessors that came in and looked at this, Tochi and Associates, you'll see, if you read the report, and I think we have the report online, there's a report online that you can pull, and it talks about each of the different systems, the plumbing, the electrical, and the HVAC system. So this term that's there, imminent danger of possible failure, you're going to see this quite a bit because that's what they said. And this report came out in 2015. So if you're an electrical engineer, some of this might make sense to you. I'm not, but I am a person who has, uh, just last week I was in my house in North Carolina getting it ready because we're closing tomorrow. Very nice to have that off the docket. But I had to go and do some electrical stuff. It does not look like that. And I understand it's just a house. But no one should have a property that looks like this. Right here, you can't see it too well, but there's uh, some masking tape. It's electrical tape. That's, that is the main power supply that goes to the high school and then goes back out to the middle school. On the right is just a regular outlet. That is not a special outlet. That's a regular outlet. If you have that in your house, you probably need to talk to an electrician because that is not the way uh, an outlet should look today. Oh, by the way, sorry. From Tochi and Associates, I spelled their name wrong, but this was their quote. So they go on talking about the, all the electrical. One of the things they say is that Pentucket has gone and tried to make efforts because students need access to electricity in certain parts of the classroom, that they put electricity in spaces that's not ideal, but it's necessary. But even with that, their quote is, it's an imminent danger of possible failure which would result in the school being without power. We can't go in and fix all the electricity in that building that far exceeds what we'd be permitted to spend. These are real pictures, and this is not the worst of them either. When it comes to the HVAC system, we are not permitted to touch any of these levers. So we can't touch this to shut that off or turn it off or that, or there's the regular levers. You have those yellow ones to shut off water underneath your sinks. Underneath Mr. Seymour's office, the electricity and the water are together. The electricity is in a place called the vault, and the water is just outside of that for the heating. You can't touch the levers. The reason why is because there is so much corrosion on there that if you hit, turn that lever or if you pull it down, they are concerned that the pipe is going to break and it's going to be something that we will either not be able to repair or will start go having uh, a double impact on the electricity. But again, Tojigi and Associates, this is them back in 2015, said it's an imminent danger of possible failure. This would result in a large portion of the building being without heat. This is steam heat, and the pipes that are providing that heat are coming from cast iron pipes, uh, both from was West Newbury and Groveland, now Groveland supplying the water to the schools. Uh, those cast iron pipes, you'll see in a little bit, have failed seven times in the last three years. The most recently, if you watch anything on front of 113 in front of the middle school, um, it, one broke 
it was in January, and they called me. I went out, and water's just bubbling up all over the place. Fortunately for the school, it was four feet into 113 in Groveland's property and not the school's property. So not fortunate for the taxpayers of Groveland, but fortunate for the school that we didn't have to uh, make that payment. But the reality is that the heat that's going through there is supplied by these pipes. And these pipes are built into the foundation of the school, and then they go throughout. So when a pipe breaks, these are not breaking. If you're familiar with plumbing, it's not at the connection points. They're fracturing in the middle because the corrosion is so much and they're underground. This one on the right uh, was actually, was, a, was this Super Bowl, the one on the right? So I think the one on the right might be the Super So the Super Bowl was on 113. This pipe burst by the field hockey field. And all of a sudden, if you were driving down 113, there was this big frost heave because it burst, it froze. That cost all water to be out to both the high school and the middle school. Uh, the permanent damage that's done there, we, we're fortunate there's a switch house. We were able to go to Groveland's, uh, into that house and switch over to Groveland water. Um, but there's no longer, there's a fire hydrant out by the um, snack shack that does not function. There's one down farm lane. And also there's a garden hose. They use a garden hose to go over the top of the school building to get the water to the snack shack so they can meet the, uh, the, the public health requirements uh, for water. Uh, so these pipes are all underneath. That is how we get our water. That is how we get our heat, because it's steam heat. So that's how the water is coming in. Mr. Seymour, just a circle in front of the high school has broke five times. Yeah, you'll see the mud. So, so, so the nice thing about these, if there is a silver lining, that we, we're good at digging holes. So we can dig holes and we can patch this, but you're not talking about a pipe that just runs the length of this room. It's hundreds of yards of pipe that you're constantly trying to find, dig holes and, and replace. We can't get into the building. Like once it goes into the building, we're in trouble. Uh, except for the nurse's office, which had a leak, which I'll talk about right now. Underneath the nurse's office, pipe burst, no one knew. Water's coming up. Someone, a police officer drove by into the parking lot. Water was coming underneath the door. They called it in. They go in, they sure enough, they see there's mud and everything all over the place. Here you go. That's what they see. The reason why? Because a pipe underneath the nurse's office burst and all the sediment went out all over the place. The crazy thing was, because there was so much water, the building was actually slightly raised with all the water underneath until it ruptured. And then when it ruptured, there was a sinkhole. So it started falling into the ground a little bit. So they had to inject what's basically the equivalent to caulking. Just, uh, I forget how many tons of caulking they put in there uh, to stabilize the building. But this is not, this, is a, this was a bigger occurrence. It destroyed part of the building. Uh, we had to take down, part of the building flooded. Those, uh, that was, those were additional parts that were added on later on. Those had to be removed. But you, obviously, school is not taking place uh, in this situation. But this is the best of our problems when this happens. Because again, we can dig holes. We can clean up. Uh, where it becomes a problem, our buildings, all those pipes, heating, plumbing, guess what surrounds all those pipes? It begins with an A. Asbestos. Asbestos, yes. So every time there's something that comes on, it's not an issue of just, hey, get a plumber, go down there and fix it. It's, OK, you got to get a plumber to go down and fix it. As soon as you see asbestos, you need to do an abatement. And that's a whole other issue. With the electrical piece, that, that, that's great. We can go ahead and we can fix all that electrical. But as soon as it goes and it's running into the walls, as soon as there's asbestos, we're stopping and we're doing a whole abatement. 1956 was a very popular year for asbestos based on the building. There is a lot of asbestos in this building. Um, but of course, we contain all that. In fact, the junior high, we had to shut down a classroom this year there was, a there was a leak in the roof, came down, went down the back of the wall. We patched the leak. That was easy. The water came down and it's underneath the tiles, so it compromised the adhesive. We shut down the room because the uh, asbestos is contained, but you don't want students and teachers stepping on the tiles that end up breaking up and all of a sudden that's up in the air. So we just shut down the room to keep it contained because we can't do an abatement in the middle of the school year without shutting down a whole slew of classrooms. We'll take care of it in the summertime, but we can't do that in the middle of the school year. So these are issues that come up pretty consistently 
uh, in, in any school year. Educationally, I'm going to summarize this very simply. Go to any other high school or junior high school and just walk around. Don't go to Pentucket. Go to somewhere else and walk around and see what they have for instructional delivery and what they have for learning spaces. It's sad when you come back to Pentucket and see, hey, our teachers are doing a fabulous job, but they are not anywhere near an optimal learning environment for what we're having to do. And you'll see pictures of that here in a second as well. Even more to the point, in 99 when I was teaching, forget that, I graduated in 94. So when I was a student, I had Hal Hutchins as my biology teacher. We had all the lab tables set up the same way probably everyone here took science. And he'd have to go between the desks and help us with our dissections. When I taught in 99, it was the exact same thing. There was a big movement, books not bricks. Don't worry, Justin, they're going to fix this for you. You'll have it updated. That never happened. When I came back this year, 2018, I went to my old classroom. It is the exact same classroom. Those children, over the last 20 years, or since I've been there, 24 years, have not had an opportunity to do a proper dissection or have a lab set up there correctly. The new building, the new part of the building that went in in 95, in a science classroom, is like a hexagon lab setup with a sink. Underneath the sink, there's gas. And you know what else is there underneath the gas? Electrical outlets. Those are three things that should never be put together in a classroom particularly when you're having students doing labs. It's nice to have all three things, but not all one right in the same place. Um, so there's all sorts of educational problems. So the biggest question people should ask, why can't we just fix it? The answer is, there is a rule for Massachusetts that as soon as you hit 30% of the building's value, you have to bring everything up to code. That includes hallways. So to be ADA compliant, if you walk into the high school, those hallways aren't wide enough. So as soon as we hit 30% or more, you have to expand those hallways. Folks, you can't just move concrete blocks easily. That is a whole other repair. So the high school repair, to repair the high school, to bring it up to code, it's about $73.2 million, today's money. And we own every single dime of it. That's not the state coming in to help us, that's us. And then to go and do the middle school is another $44 million. So there's a huge chunk of money. So it's 30%. The high school, $3.6 million is our threshold. If it's below that, we can fix it. If it's above that, we cannot. Something happens with the HVAC, which is our, mo our big, that's our Achilles heel. Something happens with the HVAC, we're in trouble. Because there's asbestos covering those, that's abatement. Even just for the HVAC system, be six or seven million. But once you started getting involved in the abatements and all everything else, you're over ten million dollars. We can't do it. The instant that happens, we move, and then the middle school students go down to their elementary schools. It's going to be incredibly crowded, but that is the reality of the situation we are in. Uh, <clears throat> and there is on the website, there's a whole contingency plan, and I did not just do a contingency plan for the high school. We did it for every single one of the schools. Last year, Page Elementary, they had a leak caused there was uh, mildew or there was mold, there was asbestos. They had to do a whole project. So I do not want, and seven years before that, Donahue School had a problem. This contingency plan is set up so that the education of our children is not interrupted. The children know where they're going. They're in a structured environment. They can count on the adults being there. And we, as a facility, for our facilities folks, have already bought 150 plastic bins in anticipation of this happening. This is not fear mongering. I am just telling you factual information. This is the real situation of where we live. So the new building. <clears throat> this is kind of a, here's an outline of the new building. I, if, good, here's a red. So this part right here where the parking lot is, that's where the current high school is. The way this project works, the community did not want to do any phasing. They wanted the kids to stay where they were, build the building, move everybody into the building, and then tear down the junior high and the high school. So this school, this is the new building right here, and this is actually sitting on uh, the football field. The football field is right here. The football field and baseball field right here. That's the location of it. Where What was the junior high, or the middle school, is now going to be uh, a multi-purpose field with turf, 
it'll be a, a stadium. Everything that's behind the junior high that's already there stays. And then we'll have this additional space in front. There's a baseball field there and hopefully some multi-purpose fields there as well. Uh, <clears throat> here's kind of a front view of it. And again, if you go to the meeting tonight, you will see, I think they, they, they're going to present a video where they do a fly over the entire grounds in a lot more detail. And that will be posted up on our website. So if you can't be there tonight, you'll be able to see that video as well. Uh, but, but here, basically what you have is it's a three floor building. So this building is 53 feet high. There's a main entrance point. So for security purposes, you have to go in. You have to check in. Someone has to let you in. Um, this is, you know, these are the, uh, this is the gym right here. The middle school is on this side, the top two floors of this side. The high school takes down these wings right here, these three floors of this wing. There's more, there's four grades in the high school, only two in the middle school. The centerpiece, there's an auditorium there, and the rest of the center part is arts. So there's a huge dedication to the arts program, and we view this as a huge opportunity for the community to use pretty consistently, whether it's for continuing education, whether it's for uh, an arts program that we're running where it's people want to come from wherever, any one of the three towns to come learn of different art um, skills or if they're interested in painting, just a place for the community folks to gather in the evenings. And because the way the building is designed, that's something that would be possible. Here's uh, just the front entrance way. This is the, uh, the, the cafeteria, which is much different looking from a regular cafeteria. All the space that's put into the new building is flexible space. Things can be shifted and moved. So if there was a performance, like we just had Sister Act at the high school this past weekend, fabulous job by our kids, um, but none of that, th those chairs would all be picked up, moved aside, and this would be the lobby going into the auditorium. The auditorium, if you've been there, saw your grandkids or your children perform like I did this past December, it will not be 105 degrees sitting in there with people sitting in the aisles. There's additional seating in here that will fit our uh, population and uh, also it'd be air conditioned. So just a comparison, this is what we have on the left-hand side right here. Here's what it would be, an idea of what it would be on the right. This is, this is always fun. So the, here is, um, this is the art room, current art room, which if you see, this was not always an art room. Right? You can see there's a garage door there. But that's where art has been placed. This is an updated modern art room. And again, we're not looking in this project. I, this was not something that we tried to go and make super elaborate. Let's put dreams and wishes. We wanted a functional space, something that was going to be the most cost effective space that was going to be durable and last a long time. And I love this picture. Here's a good physics classroom. This was the room next to uh, one of my classrooms. Uh, very traditional. You sit in the front, you go into the back to do your lab. That is not the way the state allows cl science classrooms to be set up anymore. Science classrooms, like this one on the right, you can see, if you look carefully, all these tables have wheels. They have casters on the bottom. Those have to be able to be shifted around. That's what the state wants because every room is a flexible space. You don't put something in place now that's going to be put into the ground like that lab I described in the new section of the building. That's not how learning takes, we can't predict that that's how learning is going to be in 10 years. We need to make sure that the space is flexible, it's use, useful now, and it'll be useful down the road. And here's a classic. We have a movement science program at the high school. It's a very popular program. Uh, someone was very nice and donated, someone was very nice and donated a whole bunch of equipment. Of course, where we were going to put the equipment got flooded out. Those buildings got, th those rooms got tore down. So now, movement science takes place in the hallway because that's the space we have. So overall cost, there you can see 146.3. So the state is going to pay just about $53 million. That's the estimate right now, about $53 million of that. So for you, what does that mean for you? There's the breakdown by town. And these are based on average home values. So here in Groveland, it's about $745 for the year, which is way down from what we had projected out uh, in July. So we calculated that based on the number of students. The number of students you have attending impacts how much you have to pay. We did a non-callable bond, a 2.75%, and again, we think that's conservative right now. We think a non-callable 
we could get much better than that, but we don't want to tell people numbers, and then they end up being higher than what we told them. And then there's the home assessed values. You can see in Groveland, $426,000 was the average home. So that's how we calculated all of those numbers. So the big slide. This says what happens if the building doesn't pass. Let me go through scenarios here. If the building passes, I'm sure people who are in favor of this project are going to rejoice. I will be happy that it passed because I'm happy for the future generations. However, I will be still awake at night because that building, in my opinion, and for the independent assessors, is not going to make it. The thought of putting the high schoolers into the junior high is a very real prospect that we face every single day with a possible HVAC problem. Um, so until that building get, is completed, which would be 2022, I'm going to be not having sleepless nights hoping that the building stays up and is ready to go. If the vote goes no, if there's a no vote, within that month, I'm going to be going to Selectman Wood and all the other selectmen and saying, I'm need, going to need you to check out a feasibility study for us to repair the high school. We know right now the price tag is $73.2 million to repair the high school. So that's $73.2 million to repair just the high school and $93.2 to build a brand new 7 to 12. Because after that 73.2, I'm going to come back four years later and say, we need to repair the junior high. And that's $44 million in today's money, so I can't tell you what that's going to be down the road. So if that gets a no vote, we use the buildings as long as we can, and once something happens, we're out. There's no going back. There's no fixing that. That's, we are out of that building, and the children, the, the Pawtucket Regional High School is now going to be in the junior high. And that's, that's the way that one plays out. Uh, you can look at the contingency plans. Space-wise, it's going to be crammed. They'll have one single gym. It, it, it's, for our children, less than ideal. Less than ideal. So how do you know what's going on? There's a new website. It's called the PentucketProject.com. That is a school-based website. So again, my job is not to tell you to vote yes. My job is to make sure you understand. If you vote yes, there's money involved in this. If you vote no, there's going to be money involved in it anyway. Or if you vote no on that money, it's going to be, okay, what does the town of Groveland, the town I grew up in, what is that going to look like without a functional high school? And that is a, that is a big question that I don't want to know the answer to, but it's one of the three possibilities. Uh, so look for communication from the district. That website will have www.pentucketproject.com will have all the up-to-date information. I am going around, I think even on that website, it might have a list of all the places I'm going around. I feel like I'm a, I'm a one-man carrying, I'm a, I'm a show now, right? I go from place to place. Um, but I'm having these conversations a lot. That everyone who, when they go to vote, understands what the vote is and that we have opportunities to answer questions that people have. Um, so I'll be all over the place. And, and again, my ultimate job is just to make sure everybody knows what's going on. So I'm going to stop talking. That's a lot of information. And that's my last slide, too. Um, so we have a panel here and a bunch of different perspectives. So go ahead, and I'm going to turn this back over to Nicole. But thank you for listening. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. No Barr. applause needed. But that I, was yeah, great. Nice. So um, we're, we're open for questions. So anybody have anything? Go ahead. Jim Scanlon, I live in Groveland. I have grandchildren in the Groveland school system. <clears throat> one graduated last year, another one's in the high school. I also have four grandchildren in the North Reading schools. <laughs> so I'm very familiar yes, with that. Yes, you are. Okay. Yeah. So this is my question. Since we're using the same architect, similar projects, <clears throat> the estimate, because I'm going to go back to your $4 analogy, they had to come back and ask the town for $15.5 million after they passed. Mm -hmm. So how are we, we going to mitigate that that doesn't happen? Because that, that won't work. Yeah. I'm in support of this school because it's such an s-hole, OK? And, I, and my, my follow-up to that is, how, how can we, the school budget takes a lot of money out of the town. 
it's in such disrepair, I have to question <laughs> the managing of, the, sure. of those. But anyway, so the answer, my question really is around the $15.5 million that North Reading are using the same architect, getting the same estimates. I don't know who the construction manager is. Okay. Maybe that it's the same one. I don't, I don't believe it is. Mr. Okay. Seymour, so, so actually, so the two questions. One, how do we make sure we don't go over the budget? And two, question two is, okay, why should we have faith that you're going to take care of this facility if the, the current facility is in such disrepair? Two very good questions. Uh, the politics of the first question, I will go into just a quick summary. My understanding was the architects did not, were not in favor of the town putting out a certain amount of what it would cost. They said it's going to cost more, but the town did not want to accept that. So kind of what we hear, kind of what we, well, this, so this is what I was saying. So what we hear is, uh, what could you get for 115 million? And Doran Whittier is the architect. Right now, they was, you, you're not building this for 115 million. This is what the cost is. Um, so they've had to go back, and I think there's, well, there's some lawsuit with that going back and forth. Oh, the building's completed. I know that. Oh, 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 sorry. This happened during beginning of construction. So no matter what the reason is and what you Yeah, that's fine. The fact is, it was 15 and no one, no one said this school couldn't be built for that amount. It, it was it's middle school, high school. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes, so it is, I yeah. I make sure when I put my vote in. That you're not going to get... Right, and I think from my perspective that I'm with you on, and Dr. B, I don't want to be told it's $2 and then come back and say it's two seventy five. Right, but I think he's also done a very good job at um, uh, mitigating the cost and, in, in, and managing the cost as far as what the in initial estimates were and then what they're coming in at now. So intentionally, I think we estimated very high yeah. so we know that we're not going to come back and say, oh, we were wrong, we've got we to charge another $10 million. Now that the plans are in place and things are a little bit more defined, that's come down. But you're right. I don't want to say it's going to be $130 million and then the state's going to pay X amount. Yeah, so, so, so I think for us, because you have these two individual <coughs> estimators come in, they kind of agree on what the price is. That, that's a good sign. But there are other factors. So if we know right now the, the construction market's hot. So if the, if the market were to die down, if, if the economy were to start going poorly, we, we'd get things cheaper. If there's, if there's something happened with China or whoever supplying materials, things could potentially get more expensive. But the state requires that we have contingencies built in. So there's a construction, and I'm, I'm assuming they had that in North Reading, but I can't speak intelligently about what their contingency was. I know that Mr. Seymour, myself, no matter what, like we have a whole list of, here's, here's the contingency, but here's the things that if something, there's more money that's needed, then we're having to cut. But all of our conversations uh, since... I came on board in July have been about how do we make this more affordable. So just in that time, we've been able to go from that 154 million down to the 146 by by just saying they overestimated. And I, I suspect Doran Whittier is also hypersensitive to that as being a problem because it's a I mean that's their livelihood, that's their firm. Um, so can I give you a guarantee on that? I would like to say yes, but there's. At the last selectman, one of the selectmen mentioned it was about a dollar fifty average for Groveland taxes. I see it's gone up to two dollars and four cents. So, well, the other slide said one ninety two. <laughs> yeah, I, I. But so, for me, I calculated my own just so I would know what I would be paying, and my count, mine comes out to about eight seventy five extra per year, which is still less than the thousand that was initially the estimate. Yeah, I but think. Yeah, and there was, and, and like, so we were in West Newbury yesterday, and one of the things in West Newbury that came up was that the actual cost of the taxpayer for them was not that. I don't know, I can't speak to an in, in individual town what's coming out of um, debt reduction. I don't know. Right. I, I don't know what's coming out of that. Uh, but these are the numbers that I think we have up on the website. And again, even these numbers. So if we were shooting at a target in July, you're shooting at something that's a guess. Here, the more schematic design we get down, the more accurate it becomes. And I also know, so there was a 2019 assessments. This is all based off of this year's assessments. And I think folks probably, did they just get their tax? Yeah. Yeah, so you just got your tax bill. So those other numbers might have been based off of another tax. I'm not sure. Any other uh, questions? So, sorry. Oh, there was ahead. the second question you asked. Why should we trust the facilities piece? Which was a good question. So I would say two things. One, 
1956 Chevy, if you had that and you were using it seven days a week for 17 hours, you're going to be replacing parts nonstop. Our folks right now, you can't go find a 1956 electrical piece or an HVAC piece to put on there. They're having to manufacture it, make it themselves. But to the point of the state, they are not going to allow us to go ahead and build a building without having a detailed facilities plan in place that says how you're going to manage it, how you're going to take care of it, because the same concern you have, they have as well. They're investing $53 million or so, um, so we have to have that detailed plan. And for the plan we submitted, we got an additional, we think we're going to get an additional percentage point uh, from the state, which an additional percentage equates to almost a million dollars uh, that we won't have to pay. Uh, so I would also say, uh, well, I can't control the things of the past, like that project in 95. I don't know what happened with that. What I do know is that if I walk behind the junior high, when I showed up and I walked behind the junior high, that track, the field, the courts are impeccable. And I compare the difference. And since that 95 project, we now have a business manager who is fanatical about where the money is going and making sure it's going to the right spots. And we also have something that we didn't have when I was in school or when I was teaching. We have a facilities director. And their job is to make sure everything's taken care of. So when I came in, kind of like you, you look at the facility and if you survey the kids, they'll talk about the bathrooms. They're ancient, they look horrible. So you ask, what's kind of the priority list? And he's told me the story of when he came into this position, there was a huge list and there was no funding. They were not being funded in order to take care of that list. And that was what they needed to get things to where they were. They've since hired a part-time person who's gone through and they've, trunked, they've plugged away at that list. So they're starting to get up to here. And once they get to that point, then they'll start being able to make improvements. But right now, for the last six, seven years, they've been just been playing sheer catch up. Uh, and now, as you can see on that $3.6 million, there's not a way to play catch up on that HVAC system. And even if they could have, I, there's no way to go into the walls to, to do some of what they wanted if it was 15 years ago. But the way it's managed now is the way it, we will manage at, at minimum. Uh, and I think the back of the, the middle school is a good testimony to that. Just quickly, I think while we have the students here, it would be great to hear some antidotes no. from them about um, the current facilities and how that impacts you guys in your everyday life. So do you guys want to share some of those stories? Sure. Well, um, for starters, the morale of students is very low, especially with the foreign language programs we have at the school. Um, those classes are all held at the middle school, which means the students have to go between the schools, which takes out the time for the classes. And the conditions for walking over there are also, uh, it can get icy and stuff. The roads are very well maintained, but people still fall and stuff. So, and I know the big thing was the displacement of students. That just adds on to the fact that if the high school fails, then we have to go to the junior high. Where do those kids go? That's the elementary schools, which are already packed with kids from every town, which is a huge displacement, which I know from most of the meetings, um, Dr. Bart mentioned that um, the displacement of students was one of the biggest things that the committees were talking about. So that would be a big thing. Do you guys have anything you want to share? Um, well, the bathrooms are also really bad, like toilets don't flush and sinks are backed up. Sometimes the heating doesn't work oh. in a few of my classes, like uh, my math class. My teacher knows that it's cold and even on test day, she's like, oh, you can bring blankets to class if you need them. I understand. Uh, so. Uh, Thank you, guys. So I just recently compiled all the students. We had over 1,200 students took a survey about just how they feel like things are going. In the bathrooms, and I'm glad you mentioned that, the heat was one of the big issues that they brought up. They'll be in one classroom, they'll be sweating. They'll go to the next classroom, and there's, they're, they're freezing. So you're bringing, bringing exactly. blankets. And that's not a failure of, I mean, you're running on a steam heat uh, with the pipes that you've got. Questions? So knowing that the current HVAC and electric systems um, are not up to code at the high school or not up to where we would like them to be, in the new building, what are the plans for the infrastructure for water, HVAC, and electricity? Oh, yeah. Good. So as I mentioned, um, those 1956 pipes that were that actually were not, the building opened in 56, so the pipes are probably 54-ish when they laid them. 
But initially, the plan was to keep those pipes in place to supply water from West Newbury and Groveland. We went back and said specifically, you need to take those out. Everything in the building will be the most modern, what, for so I think it's PVC piping that they're using. I don't know what they're using for the main pipes, but they're pulling up all the old pipes and putting in the new pipes. The heating system will be all run by software, um, and it'll be incredibly efficient. It'll be a lead silver is the standard that we have to hit uh, with the MSBA involved. So that means it's a high efficiency school. The cost, the comparison between what we're doing now and what we um, what we would be doing was is it's two worlds apart. It's so much more efficient. Obviously, you can control heating 68 to 72 across the building, um, and we've already had conversations with National Grid because the main supply of our on our plan, the electricity is coming from the West Newbury side of it, and that's National Grid. Of course, here in Groveland, we have our own independent folks. Uh, National Grid's aware of that, but they also want to incentivize us to make sure we put in as efficient equipment and uh, structure as possible. So they have a very lucrative a reimbursement plan, not even a reimbursement plan. Right? They are going to pay us a lot of money uh, to make sure we put in the quality items that they don't have to come back and constantly address. Dr. Bart, yesterday you talked about um, videos or pictures to make sure that we knew where everything was located within the schools too for future repairs. Do you want to touch on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So <coughs> kind of what I, I talked about, about the, the pipes going into the walls, that they're cemented into the foundation. Uh, <clears throat> one of the parts we're investigating is to hire a, uh, an individual or a, a company that comes in and they go ahead and they document not just the outside of the building, like you would see the progression from groundbreaking to the building being built, but in each classroom that they take a 3D pic image and they start piecing those together. That way, 25 years from now, instead of trying to pull a, a, a map of where the piping is, what's behind the wall, you can just pull the image and you can see a 3D image of exactly here's where the hot water's running, here's where the, the electric's running, so you know everything that's behind the wall. So if there is an issue, we know exactly where to go. Um, but that, that kind of mapping, will make things so much easier for, like I said, 25, 40 years from now that it's actually, you don't, you can see right, by, right into the wall. I have three questions. The first one is, what this is, is the- Mrs. Mickelot, we only allow for one question no, at a no, time. No, 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 no. <laughs> this is me, Justin. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, the first one is, what is the capacity, student capacity of the new school? The second one is, how is growth in, within the towns factored into that? And the third one is, is there ever a plan to move the sixth graders to the middle school? Okay, all good questions. So the building, we actually, uh, is for 965 students is what the building capacity is for seven through 12. My understanding was we had actually been told by MSBA that it was somewhere in the 940s is what we were going to be allocated, but we had resubmitted based on our current population that we said that's not going to be enough because we're anticipating some growth. So it's designed for 965 students. Um, so will it hold additional growth? Yet yeah, right now, 965 students will hold, teachers will have their classrooms. The state likes to see an efficiency use of the classrooms that they're used 90% of the time. Right now, teachers typically use their classrooms five out of seven. So if you're using them six out of seven, we can add additional teachers and growth and increase the utilization of the, of the space. It's interesting, so we traditionally are used to teachers, like I said, Mr. Hutchins' classroom was that classroom. And the way the state looks at it now when they're building projects are that because f space is flexible, people are moving around constantly and it's based on need of what you're teaching and the curriculum you're delivering. Uh, so if you're doing a special project, you might be in a different classroom. So even in the model we use, we do traditional that Mr. Hutchins' classroom is going to be his classroom, he would be fine for where we are right now. And if we have huge, if we have big growth, if there was 40B project in Grove and 40B project in Merrimack that were come to fruition, and all of a sudden we had this huge influx, we would be able to handle it. It would just be, it would be more sharing of classrooms. And your last question about is, is are there plans to move the sixth grade up to the 712? At this time, there are not. And I, I don't have that anywhere on my radar at this point. Uh, we still have the sixth graders in their hometowns uh, receiving their education. Any questions? Uh, Kathleen Roberts from Groveland. I'd just like to make a comment on the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act. 
Um, if this building was built in 1956, I'm guessing that if there was a child in a wheelchair, they could not get through the bathroom door with the wheelchair. We had that in the school I used to work in. And I'm sure there's no um, handicap stalls. And also, I'd like to thank Mr. Seymour, because my grandson had to come to school in crutches and had classes in the junior high, and they were going to get a golf cart to drive him over there, and instead they brought the class over to the high school to accommodate him. So that's another, you know, if you have people come to the auditorium that um, are, are older and they need to use the bathroom, that's all, all in this that makes much more sense to have it more um, accessible to people. Yep, accessibility is a huge Absolutely. issue. And I would also say because what we, well, my vision for our district is that we have big community involvement. So when you have folks, I know we have senior citizens that show up that walk around because it's cold outside, they use our building. Well, if you can't do that because you can't access the building, that's, that's a problem. That's not, that's not a community building. So what we, uh, in building a community building, you absolutely want it accessible for all uh, members of the community. David, I know you had a chance to tour the facilities. Did you have um, any comments that you wanted to make or any observations to provide? Uh, well, um, yes, I, I had the opportunity to, to walk with uh, Mr. Seymour and the facilities manager, Greg Haddy. And uh, I was a facilities manager at GE for some number of years. And some of the things that I saw, particularly with the initial design from the engineer, I don't think we would ever see that any place at GE personally. And some of the things that were done initially, uh, you just can't maintain those issues. If you have ever heard of the name Fred Adams, I hadn't, but he, he built all the switch gear. And that was 50 years ago and he's no longer in business. So those are the types of things that you cannot repair, you cannot replace. Um, so I, I mean that was, to me, bringing 13.8 power into the school and then back out to a transformer was one of the most absurd things that I've ever seen. So um, that's just my first impression. One thing I would like to say, what I was really impressed by when I went to school was the, the people. Dedicated to what they were doing, the children um, in passing through the halls, I was, I was amazed and, and, and awed by their behavior, and their excellent behavior. So you have a system here and, a, and a, an administration that, to me, is second to none. And they deserve this facility. Thank you. Any other questions? We have time for a couple more. Oh, it's a comment more than a question. Uh, my name is Valerie Osborne, 3 Pleasant Street. I'm the president of the Friends of the Council on Aging in Groveland. And last year, we had a project asking the residents of Groveland to support a senior center for the absolutely burgeoning number of us in Groveland. It went, it passed the town meeting, but it went down to two to one defeat at the ballot box. And I w I'm just wondering how many of the parents who uh, really supporting this project were supporting the seniors because the seniors in Groveland haven't had their fair due. And I'm, I'm, con I'm a senior myself uh, and I'm concerned that the seniors are not getting their fair due, um, especially with a project that is here seven to eight times as much as it's going to cost for a senior centre. Um, I, I was, <coughs> excuse me, I was also told by someone last week that the number of students were dropping and I wanted to ask you, Mr. Bartholomew, how, d how do the numbers, um, how do the numbers correlate now with what they were maybe five years or ten years ago? Sure. Can I take the first part? Yes. Okay. Um, so as far as the Senior Center, the Board of Selectmen in Groveland did support that project. Uh, the problem is that twofold. One, the timing of it, because everyone knew that this school project was going to be coming up. So adding another five or six million dollars to this bill was something that the town was not really appetite. They knew that this bill was coming. The other part was that that project was a standalone building at five million dollars. Now, if we had looked at something that was a little bit more cost effective, like adding onto this building and being able to 
to do something a little bit smaller and still give the seniors that that uh, designate the space that they do deserve, I think the town would have had the ability to, to take that in and this cost. So I think it, the timing of it was bad, the cost of it was bad, and not being able to negotiate a smaller um, facility and adding on to this existing structure was bad. I think we went back to that committee and said we want you to look at uh, a facility that would be added on to something that's already existing. One, so you could get that facility for the senior center, and two, to mitigate that cost. Three and a half million, five million, you put that on top of 94 million, right? So I don't know what, it, what the project would consist of to add on to this building, but it wasn't going to be three or four million dollars. And if that committee had come to us or to the town and said, we prefer to have our own facility, obviously that would be most ideal and most beneficial to everybody, but we would settle for something smaller adding on to an existing facility so that you wouldn't have to share this space with other, other meetings and other groups and everything like that. So if, if, if the committee, if this entity today came to the Board of Selectmen and, and made a proposal like that, would you support it? I would definitely look at it and I, would, I supported the last one, so I would, there's no reason for me not to support something that would be more cost efficient for everybody. Okay, Thank you. Dr. Bart, your portion. That both my children came to this district. My son ended up with a PhD from Princeton. There you go. My daughter is a teacher uh, and went through Simmons and Brandeis. And I've got a grandson who works for NASA in California. Yeah. So this school system has done very well by me. I'm a former educator myself. My husband is a college professor. So education is in our blood. Okay but also in our blood is looking after the senior citizens sure. of Groveland. And I would like the community to think about them sure. as well. Thank so so Thank let you. me ask you, I'm gonna, I'll make a commentary, but first on your numbers. So Pentucket in the last 10 years has actually decreased 26% of its student population. A big part of that, yeah, a big part of that has to do with school choice. We had school choice. So we had students coming from other communities into our school system. Uh, there's an expense to that. We would get $5,000 for every student that would come in but it would cost us on average about $18,000 to educate them. So that was a losing battle. So our population right now, so if you look at the 712 right now, I believe it's 1,140 students. Uh, but we know, so the last of the school choice students, so school choice ended, I believe they're in sixth grade. So the last students who are school choice eligible, so we don't accept new students. The students who were in, in kindergarten get to finish through as long as, they, um, as long as their parents are willing to drive them. So that's taken into consideration in this building. So the 965 number uh, would be for, we know when this building is done three years from now, we'll be down right around that number uh, for capacity. So the student population is going down while the senior population is going down. Yeah, so let me, that was gonna be my commentary. I'm sorry, this is great. So having come up here uh, and looked at how things have shifted, I think, We've had this conversation, and I actually had this conversation with, um, I've had it with uh, Representative Mira, Senator DiGiuglio, and Senator Tarr, that they are very well aware. In our area, if I talk to some of my friend's parents, who are, are seniors, <laughs> I don't, but if I talk to some of their, they, they want to stay in their towns. And first, there's not a space for them to live that's affordable because the prices are so incredibly high. The second, the second issue is space. Um, so that's where, when we're talking about this project, when I go out there and we're looking at that building, that's why it's important for me to, with the facility that's there, that was presented, that folks understand it's, we want people there. We want senior citizens to have a place to go. If it's walking through the building, if it's participating in yoga classes, whatever it is, we want that involvement. And that's shy of if something does get built. Um, there was, there was a, a point in time where I was looking at it saying, okay, is there something, once this project's done, can we look at the current admin building and potentially turn that into something that ends up being a community center that all three towns support and get behind? I think that would be a fabulous idea because, again, there is that incredibly growing need. And because I think they're saying this, the communities are becoming more gray, is I think the terminology. <laughs> uh, so because the communities are becoming more gray, there is going to be that constant need uh, for facilities like that. And, and when we hear, I'm not going to get into 40B housing. I would love it if 40B housing were including places to live for senior citizens. Um, but I think that's something that's 
that's not, but it is a very important thing, and I hope that we can address it as much as the school district can. We want to. I just want to comment on what you said with your grandchildren and your children. What's coming out of that building is great, but imagine if we have a new facility with updated technology. What could come out of that building now? Um, Irene Thomas, Groveland resident, and contributed 25 years of my life to teaching children in Groveland and in the middle school. Oh, you're very welcome. It was my pleasure. Um, oh. <laughs> Um, so I heard Mr. Roberts say um, that you were impressed with the people that you saw at Pentucket High School. Absolutely. Well, I would like to piggyback on that and say I am so impressed with the people on this committee and Dr. Bart and everyone who's getting out the real information about this project. Um, I am going to add that I think um, Perhaps a contributing factor to the senior center not passing was misinformation that got spread around. So I think it's the responsibility of all of us who are hearing the reports that we realize this is the best information, the most accurate information we can get. And in my classroom, I always said, Thomas Jefferson said, to have a, a true democracy, you need you need an informed and skeptical citizenry. Well, we are being informed, and we should be passing on this solid information on which we can rely. And we thank you for giving us the opportunity to be skeptical and ask questions. So thank you for your good work. Thank you. So I think we are right at 1130, and we said we're going to keep it to an hour. So unless there's any other questions. Um, Just one comment, if I could. Sure. So I know looking out there into the audience, I see some of my former teachers and a lot of educators who helped raise me. I just want to say thank you. I hope what you're hearing from me is a reflection of what you taught me to do, to go be critical, analyze, and then grow and develop. And I loved hearing about your children, that they've gone on. Uh, and, and so Pentucket will continue to produce high quality children and the teachers do a phenomenal job. I look back at my time through Shanahan, which no longer exists, some of you, so from Shanahan School to Bagnell to the junior high and then the high school, what I was taught has gotten me where I am today, but that critical thinking, the ability to analyze, that is still the spirit of what our children are learning today. And I think, Ben, you made a great point. Yep. There's other skill sets that I didn't, we didn't know about when I was in school that students now have access to, and our students aren't necessarily getting those skill sets because we don't have the facility for it. Um, but regardless, we will have consistently great thinkers who are doing great things and going to phenomenal schools, schools that they want to go to. That's what Pentucket's always been great about. And it didn't matter where I ever was in my educational career prior to this. Pentucket always was on my mind. What was going on in this community was always on my mind. So be able to come back and carry this information, and, and you can call it, I, I, I might call it, my wife might call it a burden. This burden of getting this information is not a burden at all because it's giving back the information the way the people taught me to tell the truth, get out there, get the facts. And if we can get out that information, people can make whatever informed decision they want to make when it comes time to vote. Well, thank you to our panelists. We really appreciate your time today. I know a few of our kiddos had to leave to go to tests. So, um, so I do want to let you all know, I think you had it on your chairs, but we are hosting um, some tours of the facilities in early April. So if you or any of your friends or family members would like to join us there to see you know, the facilities for yourself, so we definitely welcome, welcome you to join us there. Um, and as Dr. Bart said, he is kind of going on a little bit of a road show, so if you need any additional information, please keep, yeah, keep your eyes dates. out for him. Um, he, he'll be available. So thank you all for coming today. And please help yourself to refreshments on your way Thank out. you very much, everybody.